we will now take a look at the interpretation of regression coefficients. And the actual interpretation of what the results mean is a more difficult part than the calculation of the results. So whenever you run a regression analysis, the, the regression coefficients beta have to be interpreted because you, your readers of your research article don't know what the betas mean, so you have to tell them. And there are also other ways that the regression analysis can be quantified. So regression analysis tells us what is the direction of an effect and whether an effect is statistically significant or not. What we want to know, however, is whether the effects are large or not. And that depends on the interpretation. In some contexts, regression coefficient of 10 is very large. In other contexts, regression coefficient of 10 is very small. So you have to consider the context and also what are the variables involved. One of the easiest way to uh, start independent regression analysis is to look at the R-score statistic. So the R-score statistic is calculated based on the regression results and is typically presented here on the uh, bottom of regression analysis table. Another related statistic is the adjusted R-square. The R-square statistic tells us how much the variables, the independent variables together explain the dependent variable. And it's an estimate of the quality of the model in some sense. Sometimes it's referred to as goodness of fit of a regression model or as coefficient of determination. Most people just refer it to as an R-square. So the R-square varies between zero and one. Zero means that the independent variables don't explain the dependent variable at all. One means that the, regression, the independent variables completely explain the dependent variable. One problem with R-square is that it always goes up when you add variables to the model. So when your uh, number of variables starts to increase toward the number of observations, for example, if you fit a model with 99 variables to 100 observations, the R-square will be exactly one. So you always, it always increases and goes up and it's positively biased. The bias here means that if we calculate the regression analysis using sample data, the results can be expected to be larger than if we ran the same regression analysis on the full population. Because the R-square is positively biased, we have introduced the adjusted R-square statistic, which penalizes complex models. So when your R-square goes up just because you have too many variables in the model, then adjusted R-square adjusts the R-square down to compensate for that bias. So it calculates a, an adjusted value and the adjustment is based on the number of observations and the sample size. When the sample size is large and you have very small number of variables, for example, if you have five independent variables and 500 observations, so you have 100 observations for each independent variable, the adjustment is very small. If you have, uh, let's say, uh, 25 observations and 100 uh, units in your sample, then the adjustment is pretty large because you have only one, uh, only four observations for each independent variable. One problem is that the adjusted R-square is not unbiased either, but it's, uh, it can be expected to be less biased than, than the uh, actual R-square. To actually get an unbiased estimate of the population R-square is, is quite difficult, so we don't normally do that. The R-square tells us whether the model explains the data at all. So when R-square is zero, then it's end of interpretation. The variables, the independent variables, don't explain the dependent variable at all. Then the question is, uh, how much is meaningful explanation? If you explain 1% of a phenomenon, in some contexts that is meaningful, in other contexts it's not meaningful. The uh, behavior of people and performance of organizations is very difficult to e predict or explain because it depends on so many different things. And therefore in social sciences, the R-scores typically vary in, in the 10, 20, 30 percent ballpark. So if you have a 30% R-score, then you have a pretty good explanation. Or you could also have a flawed study, but we'll talk about that a bit later. So you have to consider uh, the context. In natural sciences, R-score of 99% of could be considered uh, not, not large enough. So R-square is useful for, for the first check of whether the interpretation of the results further makes sense. If R-square is too small, 
then we know that none of these variables in the model actually matter for the dependent variable. So interpreting the effects of each independent variable separately is a waste of time. On also the R square offers us an intuitive way of explaining whether the results are large or not. If I can tell, if I tell you that uh, choosing uh, the choice between three investment strategies, for example, explains 30% of the variation of your, your investment profits, then uh, that's a big deal. We understand 30% is a big deal in that, that context. So because R square can be understood that percentages, it has a natural interpretation for most people. We'll take a look at how Heckman uses the R-square in his paper. So Heckman doesn't really interpret what the actual regression coefficients in their study mean, but they are basing their interpretation of the magnitude of the effects on the R-square. And they're saying that between their control variables only model and the variables, the, the model where there were uh, the, this gender and uh, race variables, the R-square increases between 15 to 20 percent. That can be interpreted to mean that the effects of race and gender are in the ballpark of 15 to 24 percent, assuming that there's no bias in R-square, which is not true. So they should really be looking at that just the R-square in this case. But everyone understands that if we say that uh, in the customer satisfaction scores variation, one fourth of that is explained by gender and race. Everyone understands that that's a big deal, everyone who understands percentages. So that's, uh, it, it provides us a, a, an easy way of, of saying whether the results are of any practical meaning. When you have looked at the R-square, the next thing that we want to know is which of the individual variables matters. And that's uh, where we get to the uh, interpretation of the regression coefficients. Let's take a look at the Talouselma 500 example. So we have a, a sample where the women-led companies are 4.7 percentage points more profitable than men-led companies. And that's, that's a big difference in ROA. We want to know whether the difference is caused by a woman or whether it's caused by some third factor. So we have to present alternative competing hypotheses. One competing hypothesis is that it is not an effect of C and gender. Instead, it's an effect, it's a spurious correlation caused by firm revenue so that smaller companies are more likely to hire women and smaller companies are also more profitable. Another uh, competing hypothesis or second competing hypothesis is that this is an industry difference. For example, manufacturing companies are less profitable in ROA metric because uh, ROA depends on assets and these companies tend to have more assets than service companies and manufacturing companies are more likely to hire male CEOs than women CEOs. So we have the other variable here. Now regression analysis tells us what is the effect of CEO gender ceteris paribus, which is an econom economics term for holding other variables constant. So when uh, the CEO gender changes from zero, indicating man, to one indicating a woman, what is the expected increase in return on assets? Holding things constant means that you are comparing two cases that are exactly comparable on the other variables. So if we have two companies that are of the same size and same industry, then uh, a woman-led company is on average beta one more profitable. So the regression coefficient directly tells us what is the profitability difference. If it's uh, one percentage points, two percentage points or three percentage points, then it's up to us to interpret whether it's a big effect or not. We know that 4.7 percentage points is a big difference, one point probably not so big difference. Okay, so interpreting regression coefficients is relatively straightforward when these variables have a meaningful unit. So we know that ROA has a meaningful unit for managers. We, everyone, if we say uh, to a manager that my company's ROA is 20 percent. They know that it's, it's pretty good for, for most industries. If, and we also know uh, that zero is female, one it's, it's a woman, zero it's a man, so it has some meaning for us. Sometimes we, don't, we have units that don't really have any meanings and that's, uh, that's 
complicates the interpretation. So let's take a look at this question. Does one unit increase of education, does it pay off? We have a, a statement, a regression result that one unit increase in education leads to one unit increase in salary. Is it a big deal? We would need to know what is the unit of education, what is the unit in salary. Let's say that the unit is education in years and salary is uh, euros per year. So we say one unit increase in, in one year increase in education leads to one euro increase in annual salary. Does it make a difference? I would think not for most people. Pretty much every people. No one really wants to go to school if you just get one additional euro of income per year. So uh, that way it's not meaningful. How about one year increase leads to 1000 euro increase in annual salary? That's a more problematic question. If we consider uh, Finland where uh, salaries annually are in the thousands, tens of thousands of euros, maybe in the lower end if you make like 20,000 euros per year, maybe 1000 is worth one year of it, one year of education. Maybe not, depends on it's 5% depends on uh, how much you like to go to school. On the other hand, if these data were from a developing country where the annual salaries are in the 1000, 2000 uh, euro ballpark, then one euro increase in annual salary is a big deal. You can double your, your income basically in some cases if you go to one additional year of school. And that's a big thing for those people. So you have to think of what are the units, what's the unit of the independent variable, what's the unit of the dependent variable and what is the context that you're evaluating the effect in. What if we say that one year increase leads to one bitcoin increase in annual salary. So we get one additional year of education and we get one bitcoin per year more. Well that's more problematic because people don't have any uh, intuitive understanding of what is the value of Bitcoin. So the obviously when, when you say someone that, tell somebody that I'll give you a Bitcoin then the first question they'll ask what's the value of Bitcoin in euros. So in this case we could convert the value of Bitcoin to euros so we can do a conversion and express the regression coefficient uh, in, in a way that's more understandable. Let's say that one year increase leads to a uh, 3000 increase in annual salary. I don't know what's the uh, what's the value of Bitcoin now, but let's assume it's 3000 euros. So when, then we know that it's probably a big deal for some people. So sometimes we can convert the units to something that we can understand, even if the original unit was something that we don't understand easily. What if we have a case of a unit that cannot be converted? So let's say that our uh, result is that one year increase leads to one bugasoid increase in annual salary. Bugasoid is a fictional currency in, a, in a, a computer game and I don't think that anyone has uh, ever uh, developed an exchange rate from Bugasoids to Euro. So we can't convert this effect into Euro. So what do we do? One way of, of do, dealing with this uh, Bugasoid issue is that we have to uh, first understand what's the, what's the average salary in Bugasoids in this fictional universe and also uh, what is the, uh, how much are the salaries dispersed. If we say that I'll give you 10 bugasoids or I'll give you a million bugasoids, it doesn't really make sense unless we know whether, uh, what's the mean income. If we know that the mean income in that fictional world is 10 bugasoids, if we tell somebody that you'll get a million bugasoids, then a million bugasoids is probably a lot. If we give, tell them that we give you a million bugasoids, and the annual income is a billion bugasoids, then not a big deal as much. To understand uh, how the variable varies, we have to look at its mean and standard deviations. And it's useful in this case when we have these variables that don't have any units, any naturally interpretable units, look at okay, how, how is it distributed. So we take a look at our mean and standard deviation. Let's assume that in our sample the income in bugasoids is distributed normally. A normal distribution implies that one standard deviation, two standard deviations from the mean have a specially 
uh, special uh, interpretation. So in normal distribution, 68% of observations are plus or minus one standard deviation about me. So if we say that uh, our income is one standard deviation about the mean, then we know that we are solidly in the high income segment. So we are, we are pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty well about the average. If we say that our income is two standard deviations in bucasoids about the mean, then uh, we know that we are in the two top two, uh, top two and a half percent of the income distribution. We can also see that uh, generally the effect of, uh, of one standard deviation increase is pretty big. So you're solidly here below mean, one standard deviation takes you to average. Then two, two standard deviations, you are pretty rich. So you are in the, uh, in the top percent, two and a half percent. So standard deviation units can be useful for interpreting regression analysis results. So if, if we say that uh, one additional year of uh, education increases your, your income by one standard deviation in the Bugasod units. Is it a large effect? Well, then we would have to, uh, for people it is, but we would have to think what is the lifespan of these aliens. If they only live uh, on average one year, then uh, one year investment in education is a huge deal for them. So we have to think about the context again. Let's take a look at uh, an empirical example. So this is the, uh, the Deep Houses paper and uh, table two and model two from the regression results. And we'll be interpreting this purely through standard deviations. You can, uh, the dependent variable ROA has uh, a meaningful unit, but we'll just ignore it for now. So we'll just be looking at standard deviations. Their regression coefficient was minus 0.02 for the effect of strategic deviation or relative return on assets. So is it a big effect? To understand that, we would need to understand what is the, uh, the unit of statistic deviation. That's a completely made up number by them, so it doesn't have a meaning. ROI has meaning, but we'll just ignore it for now. We need to know what are the standard deviation of these variables. So the standard deviation of ROA is 0 0.7 and standard deviation of strategic deviation is 2.9. That tells us that if the data are normally distributed, then 95% uh, of the observations of ROA are plus or minus 1.4 units, that's two standard deviations, from the mean. The difference between top 2.5% and bottom 2.5% is then 2.8 units. So top 2.5, bottom 2.5, four standard deviations, it's uh, 2.8 units. So what is the effect of, of strategic deviation? The strategic deviation, one standard deviation increase of strategic deviation is uh, then 2.932 multiplied by minus 0 0.020, which equals minus 0 0.058 decrease in relative ROA. Then we compare, is this minus 0 0.058, is it larger than the 2.8 units? So the full scale is from, from the minus two and a half percent to the, to the worst, from the worst two and a half percent to the best two and a half percent is 2.8 units. And if you increase your relative, uh, your statistic deviation by one standard deviation, you get minus 0 0.058 uh, increase in R or decrease in ROA. So it's uh, a smallish effect. We can also understand the effect size interpretation and how it's reported by looking at this uh, nice example about sauna. So when, uh, when we ask whether the sauna is warm or not, sauna is uh, a finished thing. And uh, a normal research paper would say that the temperature of the sauna is statistically significantly different from normal room temperature. It's, it tells us that maybe the sauna is heating, maybe it's ready for, for going in, maybe it's too hot. Maybe it was on a day before and it's still cooling. It doesn't really tell us anything about whether the sauna is warm or not. And uh, that's equivalent of saying that the effect of statistic deviation on ROA is negatively and statistically significantly different from zero. So the statistical significance just tells that the effect, there is some effect. It doesn't tell us whether the effect is large or not. Then uh, even better, a slightly better answer is 
that the temperature of sauna is currently 80, 80 degrees and comparable that the effect of static deviation of ROA is minus 0 0.20, 0 0.20. So that is useful for people who understand what 80 degrees means and what this minus 0 0.020 means. So for most people who, who go to sauna often know that what 80% means, but you can't assume that your readers of your research study will understand your units. So you have to explain what it means. So a really good answer to whether the sauna is hot is to say that the temperature is currently 80 and then tell that most people who go to sauna regularly would say that the sauna is too hot, but they could still do it. So that quantifies that the sauna is pretty, pretty hot. More so than just saying that it's 80 centigrades. The same thing, you can say that the effect of ROA is minus 0.20 and the difference between ROAs of top 25 and more than 25 percent for standard deviation is uh, minus 12. So if you go from the least standard, uh, least deviant to the most deviant is 0.12 and the, uh, com the same scale for the ROA is 2.8. So uh, we can see that uh, 0.12 is pretty small compared to 2.8 so the effect is quite small. There are other things that you can do uh, to improve your profitability than to be more statistically defined. Let's take a look at yet another example. So this is from, uh, from Heckman's paper and uh, Heckman's paper shows a regression table and uh, now this is um, these effects are number of patients in a panel. So how many people go to see a doctor is minus 0.04 and the age of the doctor is minus 0.13, the regression coefficients. Are these large effects or not? We would have to be, uh, look at the correlation table and standard deviations and means to understand whether these are large effects in a normal case. But this is uh, actually not the normal case because these are standardized regression coefficients. They don't report it, but you can see it by comparing if you start to interpret this effect of, of number of patients in the panel, which is in the thousands and age, which is in the tens, you can see that the effect sizes don't make any sense. Also, all these effects are vary between zero between plus or minus one, which is the typical range for a standardized regression coefficient. They can be more or less, but they're typically are zero point something or minus zero point something. So these are are standardized coefficients, which means that uh, the data have been standardized. So every variable has a standard deviation of one and mean of zero before regression estimation. In that case, we estimate this directly as standard deviations. One unit increase in physics and productivity associated with beta one increase in patient satisfaction. So we say that uh, these are one standard deviation increase in, in physics and productivity associated with one standardized increase in, in satisfaction. So we interpret directly as standard deviations. There is a, this looks like the way to do it always. So it would simplify our life to always use standardized estimates, but that's actually not the case. I recommend that you never standardize a variable that has a meaningful scale. So if you have euros or years or uh, something that makes sense to people as a unit, then don't standardize. The reason for that is that standardized estimates depend on the scale of the variables because the standard deviation is a sample standard deviation. So let's say that here the standard deviation of age is 6.58 and the mean is 50.34. So the doctors are quite old. What would happen if the doctors in this sample were actually newly graduated between 24 and 28? and standard deviation would be one. What would happen is that the standardized regression coefficient for the same effect would be only minus 0.02, which uh, has a very different interpretation from minus 0.14. So it's, it's seven times as small. It's, a, it's exact same effect. It's just scaled differently. So the differential scaling means that these effects 0.02 and 0.40 are not comparable. So standardization doesn't make your results comparable. So if you can interpret the results 
without standardization, it is always better to do so. So rule of thumb, use standardization only if your variables, none of them have a, a natural scale. Otherwise, interpret the standard deviations units only for those variables for which a natural scale does not exist.